Hey everybody. Uh, welcome to Fin 303. We're gonna be talking about, uh, I guess we're a minute early here, which is fine. We'll be talking about um, DevOps security in a pipeline today. Um, I think we're doing okay on seats. So it looks good. And so um, we got a lot to get through, so we're gonna kind of rush through it a little bit. Uh, hopefully it's not too much. At the end, there'll be a link where you can sort of find more information, blog posts, um, and some of the assets that we're sort of covering. You can find some more information about them sort of after the talk. So uh, look for the link at the end of the presentation. Um, but before we jump in, um, we're going to be going over some tips and tricks, some things that maybe you can use in your own pipeline uh, if, you're, if you're sort of leveraging that sort of technology. But before we, we jump into some of the, the technical overview and information, we kind of want to talk a little bit about the motivation for the presentation today, kind of what we use as our, as our kickoff for this. So um, some of the high level uh, challenges that we face, and by the way, my name is Alan Garver, I didn't introduce myself. I'm a, a professional services consultant with AWS, um, and I work a lot with financial services customers, uh, primarily in the DevOps space, uh, continuous delivery, tooling automation, uh, DevOps organizational structures, things like this. Um, and so today, we're gonna take you through a little bit of a journey. We're working with, uh, with a customer uh, right now on a project, but it's a, it's a bunch of common scenarios that we see in financial services. And so um, some of the challenges that we, that we commonly face here are in enterprises in general, but a lot more specifically in financial services are um, monolithic applications. These are some of the things we deal with in financial services. These are applications that have been sitting in the corner of our data centers probably for many years probably some code on there that was written that they don't even teach in the code language in college anymore, things like this. Um, organizational boundaries, so we tend to have organizations that in financial services that are um, sort of that predate things like DevOps and the concepts of services oriented architectures and microservices and things like this. Uh, and then sort of regulatory requirements that we have in the space, so these are some obvious things. So we wanted to share with you a little bit, some information about a, a particular customer that we're working with share some of the perspectives and things that they're doing uh, in this space before we dive into some of the technical things that we're, that we're talking through and working through in that, in that area. So um, today we have uh, Jamie Greco. She's a senior vice president at Citi. Um, she's a technical product management uh, VP, and so she's working in this space a lot, working on a big project there, and working on them. So we're going to invite Jamie up. She's going to tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Citi. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, am I on? Okay, first things, most important first things. No. Everybody selfie. has to say cheese. Ready? Cheese. Cheese. Awesome. Thank you. Proof that I was up here, selfie. I guess. Thanks, Alan. Okay. Um, so most of you may know that it's very challenging for many of us in the financial services segment as we have been um, building up our monoliths for decades. Um, at Citi, we have a renewed focus on decomposing those monoliths, building microservices, and leveraging the services that AWS provides to release features to our customers faster. We're moving away from proprietary mainframe applications um, toward cloud platforms that leverage the services AWS provides to significantly lower our cost basis and increase our speed of development. Our goal is to automate our entire pipeline, um, including data protection, which Alan and Chuck will talk to you about, uh, making us more efficient and more secure. Um, we are achieving this by establishing empowered autonomous teams that own their own products, by decomposing our monoliths into bite-sized microservices, by taking advantage of the agility, elasticity, and resilience that the cloud has to offer, and by using purpose-built tools to enable self-service and raise guardrails that enforce and automate compliance. So, as we move to the open cloud platforms, we will decouple our business logic and our presentation logic into more atomic services that can be leveraged across multiple regions and multiple lines of business. We start by separating the view layer from the business logic, and then by abstracting the business logic from the ESB and the mainframe, resulting in data that will persist in a microservice rather than a monolithic mainframe. Decoupling our monolith decreases units of work and reduces our batch size. Loose coupling allows services to be released on their own schedule, allowing us to release features to our customers faster and more frequently. Whoops, too fast. 
We are executing our strategy using co-located, empowered, agile teams that are fully dedicated to building and owning their products. These teams will be responsible for everything from standing up their own tech stacks, to developing and testing code, to deploying and owning post-launch. As a result, changes can be isolated to a specific team, minimizing the coordination with others. This truly agile approach in a CI-CD environment reduces the feedback loop and enables our teams to fail fast and iterate more quickly. Our journey to decouple atom, uh, excuse me, our journey to deploy atomic microservices in the cloud using automated tools will resort in significant improvement in speed, cost, and quality. Single ownership structure, test-driven development, and fully automated pipeline will reduce our defect rates. Decoupled services can launch at will, allowing us to increase our speed to market, and releasing features becomes more of a business decision than a tech constraint. Utilization of cloud services lowers our overall cost. We only pay for what we need, and as we need to scale, we can scale on demand. At City, we're taking a very holistic approach to modernize how we deliver features to our customers. We're tackling the decomposition of our monoliths, we're tackling changing how we structure our teams, and we're adopting a cloud-first strategy. We're making ourselves faster, less costly, and more secure in the process. Alan and Chuck are going to review the technical details of some of the initiatives that we're implementing under all of these efforts. Great. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Jamie. Exciting stuff uh, happening at City. It's really, it's really great. So what we wanted to do is share a few of the techniques, some of the things that, uh, some of the patterns that we're sort of leveraging there, some of the things that we're, that City is, uh, is, is working on implementing, um, and share those with you. So <clears throat> before we get started, though, uh, in getting into the actual specifics of some of the techniques that we're going to talk through. We wanted to just leverage and sort of level set, set some definitions. So the assumption that we have is that many people in the room are probably familiar with the DevOps pipeline at this point. You're probably here because you're interested in learning some of the techniques uh, that you might want to consider for your own pipelines. Uh, but before, we just wanted to make sure. So we're going to just jump into some, some high level uh, information about continuous delivery pipelines. So a pipeline is really nothing more than a secure automated transport that lets you uh, typically take code from a, from a source code repository and turn it into a running set of production infrastructure that's converged and running some sort of application. So along the way, it's divided into stages. And along the way, we do all kinds of uh, t automation to deploy things. Um, it typically involves things like a config management platform to configure virtual machines and put software on there. Um, it usually leverages things like infrastructure as code. This is things like CloudFormation on AWS. Um, to, to sort of automate the, the spin up and the build of, a, of an application. And then additionally in the pipeline, in each of the stages that we have, uh, we usually introduce tests. And so we have tests that run the gamut and do different kinds of things from you know, inspecting our, our source code to make sure that we don't have syntax errors out to um, doing penetration testing or load testing across the fleet of servers to make sure that the environment that we're building is stable. And, and so that, that set of jobs and that set of automation and the tests collectively in the stages that are divided up, we're referring to as a pipeline. Pipelines do a lot of things for us. One, uh, they let, sort of let us sleep at night because the automation is there to make sure that things are running well in production environments. Um, but they also help us ensure that when there's a failure, we can give very fast feedback to our developers. So uh, imagine a scenario where a developer checks in uh, just a syntax error on their code. They commit it to their repo. The pipeline picks up and starts running the jobs, and it senses uh, that, that there's a syntax error. It can give that feedback to the developer very quickly, you know, within, typically within minutes of the commit itself. And so uh, in that case, it's a very powerful tool for us because uh, we don't have to wait for time between the, the point where we write the code and we commit it to the repo until we get the feedback on it, which in a lot of models could be weeks. Um, and, and in that scenario, you have to kind of remember what you were doing at the time of the failure. So your brain sort of has to retool. And so fast feedback is, is a really big advantage here. It helps our developers immediately know, oh, I know where that error is, and I can go fix it quickly. Pipelines can also be customized to your software development lifecycle. So um, you know, the, the common pipeline that you see um, sort of that we talk about at AWS on some of our product pages is sort of a build, test, deploy kind of model just to demonstrate those capabilities of a pipeline. 
But, but stages are sort of unstructured. You can build them as you want and customize them to your own process. And so it provides a lot of flexibility uh, in that way. Uh, we have a service on AWS called AWS Code Pipeline. Some of you may be using it. Um, it allows you to create uh, a quickly model and create pipelines and stages uh, inside of uh, a very friendly GUI. Um, you can also uh, write the code for it, write the JSON that sort of implements the structure uh, of the stages that you want in your pipeline. Uh, but it also gives you a view at a glance. So at any time, you can go in and see where your pipeline is. In this particular example, you can see that this pipeline's running. Uh, the acceptance stage at this time is in progress. The rest of the stages are, are, are complete. Um, it integrates with a lot of your favorite tools, so there's a good chance that if you're uh, using a CI process today, uh, AWS Code Pipeline will integrate with those things, and it also integrates uh, seamlessly with a lot of the other AWS services. So um, there's uh, one other element I want to touch on, and then we're going to jump into some, some good techniques for you. Um, and this is the Build Artifact Repository. So some of you may be familiar with uh, utilities or software, open source software like Artifactory or Nexus that, that refer to themselves as artifact repositories. We're going to talk about um, the importance of that here. But the notion is, is that during the build stage or when we're building or doing build activities in our pipeline, we generally will create assets that need to be stored somewhere for later use in our pipeline. And so this could be compiled Java code. You know, if your source code repository is Java classes, uh, your, your build process is probably going to involve some sort of compile. You're going to take that compiled code, and you're going to need a place to store it, to version it, uh, to reference it later. And this is the build artifact repository. And then later, we leverage that asset to, in, our, in the deploy phase when we're running our config management platform or whatever it is. So why would you use a build artifact repository? Um, it does, there's a bunch of advantages to it, but notably a few. Uh, we get to build once and deploy many times. So you know, we get to compile our Java code. We keep it somewhere. And if, if we have a fleet of EC2 instances that we're converging and we need to install that Java code on, uh, we can call it as many times as we need to from our artifact repository. We can do version control, uh, much like we do with a source code uh, repository. So we can tag builds, you know, the latest release of a build or something, so that our pipeline can always refer to the latest version. Um, and artifacts are always available in an artifact repository for later consumption. So imagine an auto-scaling uh, scenario where you have a scale-up event that's maybe a year after you did the build of your pipeline. Um, that artifact is always available for those auto-scaling events out into the future of time. So, and one of the other important things that we talk about in this space is the fact that it allows your build server to be sort of disassociated or not connected to the instances that are converging in that pipeline. So your deployed instances don't need to actually be talked to or even be talked to from your build server because they independently using this, this artifact repository as, an, as a medium in between. So what are some things that you do with pipeline build of artifacts? Um, the example that I put here is a chef cookbook. So in this particular example, um, we don't have a chef server in our build system. Uh, we're simply brokering chef cookbooks into this environment. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, Chef is a configuration management platform. It's a, you can write a manifest in code that essentially represents the state of a virtual machine. Um, and you go through this process of convergence, which means the Chef uh, code itself will return that, that virtual machine into the state that's expected. Um, so in this particular case, we're going to use our artifact repository to store a bundle of cookbooks that, that we're using Bookshelf to assemble, uh, Berkshelf. So we have a Chef cookbook. It's in our source code repository. We do a Burks vendor on it that will gather all the dependencies and build the tar package. We'll push that out to our artifact repository. And then later, our running instances can call those objects out of our artifact repository and run the Chef client to converge. Um, there's lots of other examples of where you would use build artifacts. Uh, config management's all over the place. We have Ansible, Puppet, Chef. Uh, but we have other things like Java, the other things you might expect, even Ruby, Python, you might host Ruby gems or compile Java classes like we've already talked about. So um, one of the things we want to sort of talk about is a, a simple artifact repository on AWS. So um, we're going to take you through a scenario where you might use a build server uh, with just by just simply creating an Amazon S3 bucket. S3 is our simple storage service. It's, uh, you have the ability to create a, a bucket, which you can put objects into, and you can store uh, an unlimited amount, virtually unlimited amount of objects in that bucket. Uh, and you will only be, you only pay for the storage that you actually use. And so in this particular example, we have a build system in the lower uh, left of the diagram. Our, our build server is very simple. We just have a Jenkins server running here with Maven and Git installed. Uh, and we're going to use our artifact repositories just by creating an S3 bucket. So we set up a Jenkins job. It detects the commit on a source code repository that's living somewhere, maybe GitHub. 
Um, once we sense that commit, we'll pull the code down and maybe we'll use Maven to do a package. So we will compile the code and build all the dependencies in that we have. And now we have an assembled build artifact. We'll publish that artifact using a simple AWS API call through S3 to put the object into the S3 bucket. And then we'll launch our EC2 instances with an EC2 API call. Uh, and in this particular example, we're going to pass in some user data. User data is, is a way that we can pass in uh, characters into an instance at launch so that it can reference that only at launch. Um, and it will refer to maybe a URL to the object that we have in S3 or some other method if we've got pre-build scripts running on that in the AMI that we have uh, that we're launching in this particular case. So our EC2 instances will come up, and our converging systems will retrieve the S3 object from S3 with an S3 get object call. It's a very simple artifact repository. Um, it's a common sort of pattern that we see used in a lot of places uh, for, for publishing build artifacts uh, in a continuous delivery system. So but we're going to take it to the next level. So S3 is, is a great product, um, but we're going to talk about how uh, we can build in some super strong security into this because we're a bank. Uh, and we're, and, you know, there's a lot of things that we care about along the way. So we're going to implement three different things real quick, three different ways that we can make our simple artifact repository very secure. The first way is we're going we're gonna to implement some data protection using AWS KMS, which is our key management service. It's a service that allows us to uh, leverage uh, keys, uh, encryption keys, that we can uh, entitle certain people to have access to and use to encrypt and decrypt objects. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're going to uh, talk about an entitlement system in this space. Uh, using AWS IAM and some resource policies. And then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ensuring integrity in the system and some of the things that we can do there. So we have a pattern that's common. Uh, a lot of times you'll see key services, um, key management services like AWS KMS. Uh, they generally will allow you to stream a certain amount of data in through the service. So the notion here is, is that you have an object or something that you want to encrypt. You will pass that object to a, a key management service. The key management service will then return to you the encrypted version of that object. Um, and you will have to come back to the key management service to decrypt, because the key is stored in a safe place that nobody can get to. Um, and so in this particular example, uh, we have the ability to send typically small things to the KMS service, but we wouldn't want to send large binary files like what we're dealing, dealing with in the case uh, of our build artifact repository. So if we have a Java set of Java code, or maybe some binary objects or something that are maybe gigabytes or megabytes in size, um, these are things that you typically wouldn't want to pass to a key management service and wait for a large response. And so one of the patterns that we see adopted very common in this space is this notion of envelope encryption. And so what we do here is we, we will typically generate a key uh, locally to wherever the object is that we're trying to encrypt. We will encrypt the object with that key, and then we will ask the KMS service to encrypt the key itself. Right? KMS actually provides a nice feature uh, called generate data key. And what generate K data key will do is when you make the API call to KMS and you ask for it to generate a data key, it will use a custom, customer managed key to provide you two, two key elements. One is the plain text version of a key that it generated for you, and the other is the ciphertext blob. The plain text version is the unencrypted version of that key, and the ciphertext is the encrypted version. And so what we can do is we can take the plain text that was returned by the KMS service. We can uh, use something like OpenSSL locally to encrypt our very large binary object with the, with the plain text of that key, store that encrypted out from that, from that operation uh, in a tar file along with the ciphertext that KMS returned to us. And now we have an envelope. And the envelope contains the encrypted binary object as well as the ciphertext or the encrypted version of the key that was used to encrypt that object. And so this is a client-side encryption pattern. And when we implement this, a pattern like this, into our uh, artifact repository with AWS uh, on S3, you can see we've added a couple of, I've added a couple of quick steps here. One is the third step to encrypt. So after we've done our Maven package uh, and we've compiled our Java code before we publish to S3, we can add this KMS generate data key, envelope encrypt the contents of our, our compiled version of Maven that we got from Maven and publish that now to S3. Bucket. And so now we have a client-side encrypted object that's sitting out in our artifact repository. Um, but we're going to add a little flag here, too, because S3 supports uh, server-side encryption. And server-side encryption is uh, basically the notion that you can generate a customer-managed key in uh, KMS that you can then use to grant access to the S3 service so the S3 service can encrypt at rest on your behalf. And so we're going to ask the publish, when we're publishing this object to S3, we're going to ask it to implement server-side encryption as well. So now we have both uh, client and server-side encryption for that object out in our S3 bucket. So we've covered a little bit about encryption with our, 
with our artifact repository, uh, let's talk about entitlement. So entitlement, um, we have the ability with a lot of the services at AWS to provide uh, resource policies on several of the things that you can create. And so two of those examples are um, through S3, Amazon S3, we have the ability to implement bucket policies. And these are policies that are uh, associated directly to that resource, to that S3 bucket. So when we created a, a policy, it's like an IAM, IAM policy that's applied at the service level. We can also apply policies to keys. And so uh, the examples I'm going to share with you here, um, we're going we're gonna to add a little bit of entitlement into our artifact repository system. By this particular S3 bucket, we're going to create with CloudFormation. This is a this is the new YAML version of CloudFormation that we announced a couple of months ago. Um, so this is a YAML CloudFormation template you're looking at. Um, and you can see here we're creating an S3 bucket, and we're actually uh, associating a, a bucket policy to that bucket. And so um, there's two things in the statement. There's two sort of particular actions that we're doing. We're allowing get object and get object ACL to this bucket, and we're also allowing uh, list buckets to our, to our S3 capability in the account. And we're associating this to a role. So you'll notice the principle here. Um, where we're saying we're getting attribute, we're asking for the ARN, the Amazon resource identifier for our uh, for a role that we've created previously, and so we're we're associating this particular policy to a particular role. In this case, we're calling the role artifact artifact client role, and we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So we basically wrapped a policy around this S3 bucket that says only things that have the artifact client role can get objects from this S3 bucket. Similarly, we can go to the uh, the KMS side, and we can put a, a KMS policy around the key that we're going to be using, the customer managed key. And so what you're looking at on the right side of this diagram is a, is a policy that's associated to our KMS key. And in this particular case, we're allowing decrypt and describe key, again, to our artifact client role. So we've now associated these things to, uh, to both our S3 bucket and the KMS key that we use to client side encrypt objects. Um, and we've launched an EC2 instance and asked it to go and pull objects and decrypt them but it's being denied. And it's being denied because we forgot to associate this instance to the client role. So let's take a look at what that looks like. We've now created the client role. So this is the role that got associated to those policies that we just showed you. And in this particular example, uh, we've just done some simple operations, get bucket and list my buckets, which really isn't enough permission for the EC2 instance to do much with our, our key and our bucket. But because this thing is actually in the artifact client role, we've associated to that specific role that we've tied to those policies that we've put around S3 and KMS, uh, we now have, this instance now has the ability, or it's been granted access uh, by the policies themselves to both pull the objects from S3 and decrypt them with KMS. Um, so that's a little bit about uh, entitlement in our, in our uh, simple artifact repository. Let's add a little bit of uh, integrity checking. And so um, this is a common uh, thing that we see done uh, in a, with a lot of IT assets where we use SHA summing. Um, in this case, in this particular example, we're using SHA-256 summing. And the notion of summing an object or SHA summing an object um, sometimes we MD5, but we don't see that done much anymore. Um, uh, but uh, with SHA summing now, what we do is we'll take a, a binary object, we'll run it through a mathematical equation, and it kind of looks at the ones and zeros, and it produces a unique string associated with that. And that string, no matter how many times you pass that object through the algorithm, will always produce the same string. And so in this particular case, we're going to use this to validate the integrity of our object. And so we're back to the envelope encryption at the point where we're envelope encrypting and we're stuffing in this envelope our encrypted source. And we're also putting into the envelope uh, the, the encrypted ciphertext of the key that we use to encrypt it. We can also jam into that envelope the SHA sum of that object uh, at build time. So when the build server builds the object, just before it encrypts it, it can generate a SHA sum of the object after it's been decrypted, put that into the envelope. Uh, and then later on, uh, when we are uh, pulling the object from our EC2 instances, before we run the CI on the system itself, we can validate the integrity of that object by comparing the sum that's in the envelope to the actual sum of the binary object that we would be installing. Um, and so this adds a little layer of integrity uh, into our system. And so um, we can also add another step in here. Uh, a lot of times what we, uh, what we see in this space is where maybe you have uh, an entity that you want to kind of look at artifacts, things that are being passed through your CI system, and you want somebody to sort of review them or do a security review on them. And in this particular case, you can implement something like uh, an authorization system that can validate the integrity. And so in this, in this example, we might have something simple like an Amazon DynamoDB table. Um, DynamoDB is a, is a database service that we provide um, that can do simple key value object 
uh, calls. And so we might just store in this Amazon DynamoDB table uh, a list of SHAs that we're allowed to install. And so now on the client side, when we are converging an instance, um, we can make a call to the system and say, am I allowed to, uh, to implement uh, this particular artifact? And if it's in the table, it will, it will return, yes, you can. Or if it's not, you can say no. And that build would be blocked. So, um, uh, so real quick, we're going to talk a little bit more about the pipeline. We're going to go into some more elements of the pipeline and how we can customize it. Um, we work a lot in this space with a business partner called Stelligent. Um, Stelligent has done a lot of work. They specifically work in the AWS space uh, doing uh, DevOps and continuous delivery. Uh, and Chuck Dudley is here from Stelligent. He's uh, the director of financial services accounts there. Uh, and he's going to take you through a little bit more. Great. His associates to it. Thank Thanks, Chuck. So I want to go back to the pipeline that Alan was talking about and go into a little bit more detail on that. Uh, as Alan mentioned, uh, it's a very simple concept, uh, build, test, deploy. Uh, it, um, in spite of the fact that it's a simple concept, it's very powerful. It's powerful because it gives you a, an easy and, and simple means of having repeatable, uh, consistent testing every time there's a code commit. Um, this means that you're application is going to be tested the same way every time. It's going to be held up to the same standards. You're going to prevent regressions. Uh, it also means that you have an automated, automated means of deployment of your application anytime there's a code commit so that you're no longer dependent upon uh, um, an operator or an engineer utilizing a runbook and perhaps there being variants in the means of deploying. Uh, but we can do better than this. This is the uh, pipeline that we typically look at, made up of, of more stages than the, the simple example we just talked about. There's a commit stage where we examine our code, an acceptance stage where we examine our application, a capacity stage where we examine the environment. There's a pre-prod and production phase that together represent the fourth stage, where a pre-prod is us building a candidate environment for deployment into production, and certain testing takes place, and then we do a blue-green deployment, most likely, typically, um, to bring that new candidate uh, environment into production. So uh, the typical commit stage that you see, the primary goal of it is to provide fast feedback to the developer. They want to know very quickly if the code they've written, if the changes they've just made uh, are, are reasonable and will do what they expected. Uh, in order to get that fast feedback in this commit stage, we actually only look at the code. We don't build um, any artifacts from it. We don't build any AWS resources. We just want to examine the code and see if it passes the smell test. It meets our standards, meets our requirements. So typically in the commit stage, you'll see things like unit tests that the developer writes along with this code to validate it to doing what he expects, and static code analysis, which might uh, ensure that you're following best practices with your code, um, proper test coverage, things like that. We can add to this uh, and, and make this stage a little stronger. Uh, essentially what we want to do is add security to our pipeline in all of our stages, uh, have it baked into the process. So one of the things that we can do is perform security static analysis of application code. This is uh, this is an analysis that actually looks at your code and can see potential vulnerabilities before actually building an executable. You, you can do this with tools like uh, LAPS, Flaw Finder, um, and others, depending upon the language that you're using. We can go one step further, too. As Alan mentioned, we have uh, infrastructure code as well as application code uh, in the DevOps pipeline. We can perform security static analysis of our infrastructure code and determine if we have any problems, any issues with um, the, se the security of the resources that we intend to create. So in order to be able to do security static analysis of CloudFormation, we need to do a few things. We need to build a model of the resources that the template intends to create um, and then be able to analyze that model. This allows us to stop bad things before they happen. Uh, whereas with application code, you go ahead and you build that application code 
uh, and then test it. It's tested in a sandbox environment, and it's, and it's reasonably safe. Um, even though you're in a sandbox environment, when you're creating resources in the cloud, you have the potential for creating resources that open you up to the world, and therefore the level of risk is considerably higher. Um, the other interesting and very powerful thing that this does is it allows a security organization to define their policy, to define their security standards in code, and have that code um, unambiguously verify uh, against all development efforts that they meet the, the best practice and the standards of the organization. So it essentially allows the security organization to scale across the enterprise um, and, and be certain unambiguous about the, the rules that must be met in order to create safe environments. So um, when we decided to start adding security static analysis to our pipelines, um, we, we looked around for different tools that might help us to do this, and we really couldn't find anything. We couldn't find anything that did analysis of cloud formation templates um, prior to creating resources that also worked very well or, or very easily in an automated pipeline fashion. So we went out and wrote a tool called CFN NAG. It's an open source tool. You can pull it down off our GitHub repo. Uh, and essentially what it does is it inspects the JSON of a CloudFormation template before convergence, before doing a create stack, um, in order to find patterns that uh, may put you at risk. Things like overly permissive IAM policies or security groups or disabled access logs or server-side encryption. So now I'm going to do what no, no sane man should ever do, and that's to stand in front of a thousand people and do a live demo. Can we, uh, can we switch to the demo, please? Am I on? Okay, good, great, thank you. So, so first we're gonna start um, Sorry. So first we're gonna start with a very simple CloudFormation template. Um, you know, this may look like a perfectly reasonable template to you. Uh, we have, uh, on our ingress, we have a single port being open to a single IP address, and you might think that's, that's a perfectly valid thing. If we actually run this through our, um, oops, sorry. If we actually run this through CFN NAG, we'll find that this fails. So, you know, immediately, within a second, we can determine that this doesn't meet our security requirements. Why doesn't it meet our security requirements? Well, it's because there was no egress rule applied to that security group. Uh, the implication of that is that if someone were to um, infiltrate that system, they are able to send out data, potentially very sensitive data, on any, all, through any port out to any IP address and have it escape you know, your organization. So. So this is something that we consider a drastic failure that should never happen. So if we go ahead and modify just very slightly that same CloudFormation template, you can see that we've added an egress rule um, where we've locked it down to only being able to send that data on a single port, port 80. And we'll run this through our uh, CFN NAG tool again and find that the failure has been eliminated and it's produced a warning. Now, typically, a warning will be allowed to flow through the pipeline, but it's still feedback we think it's important for the developer to have. Uh, the significance of this warning is that the uh, egress rule was, although it was a single port, it was out to any IP address in the world, which means it could potentially be problematic. Uh, if it's intended that this is an outward and external facing web server, then, you know, port OED, AD open to the world might be a fine thing. Uh, if this is a tool that is supposed to be used internally on an organization, well, you might want to lock down the CIDR block a little further. And if we in, indeed uh, change that uh, egress rule to locking it down to a, a slash 24 or even a slash 16, then this would pass without any warnings at all. Let's also look at uh, another example. Here we're creating an EBS volume that we intend to attach to uh, an instance. Again, looks like a pretty normal kind of template. We're, we're describing that we want to create a volume, the size, the, the type, the IOPS, and where we want to create it.
But if we run this through CFN NAG, again, we'll find a failure. And the failure is that uh, server-side encryption is not enabled. Uh, to us, it's a no-brainer. It doesn't really cost anything to have server-side encryption, so there's uh, logically no reason you should ever not have it on. If we go back and modify this CloudFormation template and add in encrypted true, we run, then run through and we, uh, we, we pass without any errors. Okay, can we go back to the slides now? Thank you. And I'm not done. <laughs> I just made it through. Thank you, though. So next, I'd like to talk about the acceptance stage of the pipeline. If you remember what I said before, the commit stage has to do with examining the code. The acceptance stage has to deal with examining the application. So typical activities you would find in the acceptance stage of a pipeline are integration tests and acceptance tests, uh, pretty common practices for, for most organizations. Again, we want to ratchet that up a little bit uh, and, and add security to our pipeline. So what we want to do is infrastructure analysis at the same time. Uh, if you think about it, if, you're, if you compile an application like Alan was talking about, Java, uh, you're going to want a place to run it. You're going to create some additional resources. So you, uh, you have an environment that's now changed, and there's some impact to that. What's the impact? That's what we're trying to determine. So. Um, so we're really what we're trying to do here with this infrastructure analysis is to prevent infrastructure analysis that violate security policies that might put us at risk. Um, and we want to be able to do that rather than by manually a security um, individual examining um, something and telling us whether or not they like it, whether or not it meets policy. We want to codify that sec those security rules um, and get notifications um, when violations occur. That's also pretty important because in addition to us in our uh, pipeline uh, creating resources, making changes, there's also the potential of people making changes outside of the pipeline, out of band. And uh, what that means is that the security of the application might also be altered by out of band changes that are coming in. So we want to be able to check for all that stuff. And finally, we want to be able to um, execute this on demand uh, within our pipeline. So the obvious tool for doing a lot of this is uh, the AWS config tool and setting up the proper config rules to uh, track this. But the problem is that pipeline enablement of uh, AWS config can be a little bit challenging. Uh, it's not really designed to be um, tested in a pipeline so much. Uh, it tends to be somewhat console-centric, where you, you would go to see your results and such. So we wanted to add to that. We wanted to use that core technology, um, but we also wanted to make it easier to use within the confines of a pipeline. So we wrote another open source tool called Config Rule Status. Um, so what does this do? How does this help us? Well, we're still using AWS Config under the hood, but it allows us to set AWS, AWS Config up for resource monitoring in an automated fashion. Um, it creates config rules and Lambda functions to evaluate the security compliance. Uh, it creates a tester Lambda function so that from within the pipeline we can easily test and essentially get back the results of what are our asynchronous analysis of our environment. Um, it comes with a bundled CLI that allows um, for easy deploying of the tool, um, can be invoked with a CLI, uh, and uh, it, you can invoke it from within the pipeline to very easily catch policy violations before they get to production. Technology it uses, clearly it uses AWS config. It also uses Lamb to automate the process of, of rolling out uh, the tester function and the deployment functions, uh, CloudFormation for creating supporting resources, and the serverless framework for uh, actually invoking the, uh, for orchestrating the deployment of Lambda uh, in support of the service. So uh, on this diagram here, uh, we, this is the overall architecture of an environment utilizing config rule status. And as you can see at the top there is our deployment pipeline where this is actually going to be consumed. Uh, the next level, next level down, you have the rules definition, the config service that has to be stood up in order for you to be able to do that testing. Um, and then the third level, the green level there, is the Lambda service, which is used to facilitate um, the automatic uh, creation of the, the uh, or configuration of the service. 
Uh, and then finally, you have the actual environment at the fourth layer uh, that's being analyzed. Uh, having dodged the bullet on the first demonstration, I'm actually going to do uh, a video screencast um, to show uh, uh, config rules status in action. So, so like I said, it comes with it comes with the the tooling, the the code to automate the process of installing and creating this. So right now, what is going on is that the serverless framework is is standing up, creating the initial resources that we need in order to be able to to ex to execute to implement the environment. Um, the next thing that's going to go on, as I mentioned, um, is that we are going to cr deploy Lambda functions for rule logic. Uh, we support both standard conf uh, config rules as well as custom config rules that you can define yourself, and this will allow you to represent those in code and build them into the environment. So it's, it's setting up all the resources necessary, the topic, the bucket, so on and so forth. Um, at this point, we're, we're now deploying um, the configuration in order to uh, be able to support uh, the, the testing through config rule status. And it's actually deploying the rules at this point in, um, in the process. And here what we're doing is some examples of, of how you can use it. You can use it from a command line. Here um, we're running some Mocha tests, actually testing the environment. So um, what's going on is you know, this diagram right here is showing you what the code might look like within your pipeline to actually consume the results of the Lambda tester function. Um, and we do that, and we see that we get a failure. If we go in and look at the results text, we will find that we failed on the multi-factor authentication rule. Um, the multi-factor authentication rule essentially says that all users must use multi-factor authentication. We go to the console and look, and sure enough, someone's created a user that has no multi-factor authentication turned on. We resolve that problem here, run the test again, and it, you'll see that we now pass. Uh, very important thing is that when you encounter any problem in the pipeline, you, you stop the line, fix the problem before you're allowed to continue on, and that's exactly what we're doing in this case. Uh, even though it wasn't with our code, it was with the environment, it's still very important that we, we get a consistent environment. So, okay, if we can go back to the slides now. So, uh, those are probably, that's the, all the time I have to go into detail in those stages, but there's certainly testing that you can do in the other stages of the pipeline. The capacity stage, as I mentioned, is really where we want to test the environment. We want to, um, we want to understand uh, the environment structured as we intend to have it built out, how we, will, um, how we will fare as far as our security is concerned there. Again, capacity is a standard stage you see in a lot of pipelines where you might do performance tests or load tests. Uh, if we want to add security to our pipeline, we might want to do something like penetration testing um, or image testing, actually testing the OS configuration for vulnerabilities. And that can all be built into the uh, capacity phase, and we have tools that support that that you'll find in our GitHub repo. Um, uh, when you go to the process of going into production, the production stage, as I mentioned, there's two phases to it, pre-prod and production. Uh, in the pre-prod, we're building the candidate environment um, which we intend to put into production. And so we might want to do things like check for out-of-band changes um, in, uh, in the environment, uh, as well as, sorry, I, I skipped something here. So in, so in the pre-prod stage, um, we will definitely want to continue to do testing, do smoke testing of the environment, because this is, this is no longer a test environment, this is a candidate production environment. So a lot of the testing that we've done earlier in the pipeline gets repeated here uh, before we make the final go, no go decision about rolling this into production. And the very important thing is when we actually get into production, we want to continue the same kind of testing. Essentially, the testing that we do all through the pipeline becomes the monitoring of our production environment. And the reason for that is because, again, out-of-band changes can degrade our security posture 
as we move through. So it's very important that whatever we've defined as our proper security posture uh, needs to be tested, not just when we make a decision to roll into, um, into production, but also as we're in production. So when we use configurable status, we, we utilize it such that we are able to continue to have it run and to be able to report and notify us about um, changes. So as Alan mentioned, there's a, a lot of code around everything that we've talked about. There's a web page out there, stellage.com slash fin303, that'll point you to a series of blog, blog articles, as well as a series of GitHub repos, which have information on everything that we've talked about today. Um, it's all open source, all available for you to use, so I would encourage people to, uh, to get out there, take a look at it, try to incorporate these processes into your, uh, into your continuous delivery pipeline. So thank you, everyone.